Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're pleased to have uh, the, the uh, senior pastor of the Arcadia Presbyterian Church with us tonight. He bunks with this lady back here. Uh, we're uncertain who the head of the household is, though. I'm not. <laughs> and uh, uh, we have no idea whether why he comes here and sits here and makes us learn stuff. But uh, we're told that tonight you've got to be very careful because there might be a test. So take your notes. It'll be open, open book test, I'm sure. So uh, have fun. But here's now our friend, Will Brown. What's that so hard? Well, I am uh, Will Brown, and I do preach out in Arcadia, uh, but my main claim to fame is being married to Mingy, uh, and being her, I do a lot of driving Miss Daisy around. Um, <laughs> tonight, we're going to go backwards in time, because Sunday was Easter, and the scripture that Steve told me I was to work on is from before Easter. It, I found myself in some kind of a, an emotional uh, turmoil as, as I started working on this again because I was so glad to get to Easter in real life and then he was putting me back there again. He also told me, that I'm to start at verse 32, and I'm to get the chapter done by the end of the lesson. I've noticed that sometimes he doesn't do that himself, but I will do my best to get done to the end of, uh, end of the chapter. Uh, we uh, talked about a test here, and what I want to say is if you ask questions, we won't get to my test. So we want some participation and uh, some questions from all of you. And I'll answer at least one or two of the questions if I know the answer, but then I'm going to expect all of you to help me too because all of you have lived through this season of the year and Easter uh, many times. There's some things that we're going to be looking for tonight that I really uh, hope that you're going to recognize, maybe not learn, but recognize as things that are important in the gospel according to Mark, and also that are things that are important in our lives as Christians. But let me start with a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you that we can come together on this night, be fed good food, uh, eat with one another, and Together learn from your scriptures about your love and your grace for us. We ask that you would bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing that I'm hopeful that we will recognize or learn is that the role of the women in the gospel according to Mark is steady. It never stops. The weakest it gets is that they stand at a distance, but they are never gone in the gospel according to Mark. They are always present, and not only are they faithful and always there, they're also very observant. They watch what's going on, and they're also very courageous. They're where none of the men dare to be. Now, in the other gospel, you get the beloved disciple in there with the women, but, but not, not in Mark, you don't get that. So we need to be watching for the role of women, and as um, one of the commentators says, that in the gospel according to Mark, women are presented as the best human disciples, the model human disciple. Not that they're perfect, but they're a lot more perfect than, than we men are. So that's the first thing we want to learn, is that 
that women are powerful role models in the gospel according to Mark. And we always just sort of, you know, the, that old thing about where's Waldo, you know, in the picture, you need to search out where's Waldo. Well, in the gospel according to Mark, you got to keep searching for where the women are. Because where the women are, something important is going on. We will also notice that the disciples, I assume this may also include the women disciples, lose their innocence in these verses. They enter this with expectations about what Jesus is going to do and, and going to be and what the future is going to look like. But by the end of these verses, all of those dreams have gone up in smoke. There's no possibility that what they dreamed would happen would happen. They had heard Jesus talking about the crucifixion, the tearing down of the temple, and all of these things, the whole three years or whatever that they had been with him, and they'd managed to be able to ignore him the whole time. And to think he's just talking about something that's going over our heads, but we know what's really going to happen is going to be glorious and wonderful, and we're going to play an important role. So, they are gathered together, and they have lost their innocence. Their master was crucified, and their master is dead. And so for the disciples, wherever they are, because they aren't there where Jesus died, except the women, the men are gone somewhere we don't know, hiding out. We know later when Jesus appears to them, they're behind locked doors. So part of the losing of their innocence was becoming very afraid that what was done to Jesus might be done to them. They do not yet know of the resurrection, so they don't yet know about the upside of the resurrection. They have no concept of that at all. And I was going to say they are like where we are because we're going back before Easter. But I'm not sure we have the ability to unknow what we've heard in Sunday school and in church our whole lives about the glory of the resurrection and Jesus' return to life. I don't think we can even begin to get a grasp for what the disciples must have been feeling as they're dealing with a world and a life that no longer has Jesus in it. What amazes me is that as we look in these verses and as Steve gets into Mark 16 uh, again next week, we're going to see one amazing thing that I hadn't thought about or noticed in the gospel before, is that the disciples are still the disciples. They don't disband. They may not have been at the resurrection, but they knew where each other was. They knew where their homes were. They don't quit being disciples even though Jesus is dead. And I wonder what was in their minds besides trying to deal with the terrible shock of Jesus' crucifixion. But I wonder what their hopes and their thoughts about the future were in that period of time between when they know that Jesus is dead and they first hear about the resurrection. On Good Friday, I used to preach a sermon that talked about even if there is no resurrection, God's love sacrificing Christ on the cross is enough. Is enough. For me to know that God loves me, to, for me to know that there's a task for me uh, to do in service of a God who would send Jesus as his son. 
to suffer and to die and to bring me in eventually salvation. The disciples also don't are beginning to know at this point as they're gathered in whatever homes they're in, hiding out from their fear of Roman soldiers and the temple's guards, they are beginning to understand that if Jesus was crucified and went through that terrible suffering, then maybe the cost of their discipleship is an awful lot higher than they had hoped or expected it to be. Now they knew that crucifixion was a real thing and that it wasn't something from which people who followed Jesus were likely to be excused. If Jesus had to be crucified then and they remained his disciples, why would they not also possibly suffer like that? especially because Jesus has repeatedly told them that they are going to suffer, that they are going to face imprisonment and torture, and there, some of them are going to face crucifixion as well. One of the surprising things that I noticed in the reading of the Gospel of Mark, this little section, was about the role of Pontius Pilate, because Pontius Pilate comes across in the gospel according to Mark as someone who really has no animus about anyone. He's not out to get anyone. He doesn't want to order Jesus' crucifixion. He doesn't want to order anybody's crucifixion in particular. He just is there. And he has a responsibility to Rome, and he's going to fulfill that, and he's going to take the path of least resistance. I probably did not start with this man, but I first heard from Richard Wilbur, who was the librarian of Congress for, I mean, the poet laureate for the nation for a while, who said, that the opposite of hate is not love, but it's apathy. And I think Pontius Pilate is apathetic. He couldn't have been much more dangerous if he had hated Jesus than what he does because he really doesn't care. He thinks Jesus is innocent, but, oh well, okay. He doesn't care enough to take some action to do something to make sure that justice happens. Hate is not his vocabulary, but apathy certainly is. So I'd like us to begin now, and I want to run through the verses that we have, verses 33 through 47, which is the end of the 15th chapter. And I want to go through and bring some of, um, some of the background up and remember, I'm welcoming questions. Just hold up your hand. So it begins, when it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Now, Mark 13 to 24. 13, 24. You have that one, Peg? Mingy? I guess I didn't give them out in order. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. Okay, this is a prediction that Jesus has said back in chapter 13. So Jesus knows that the darkness is coming, and there will not be light, and that there will be suffering. And it also refers back to Amos 8-9. Do you have that one, too? And on that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. The darkness that is being talked about here is a, a sign of cosmic significance. This is to get our attention that this is not just any old crucifixion. Something is happening in connection with the crucifixion 
that is utterly new and utterly powerful, and it is so powerful it's been talked about by prophets going back to Amos, and Jesus has talked about it in the time that he was teaching. So we have Jesus there on the cross. He's been crucified. Steve dealt with that part last week. So he's up on the cross, but he is still alive. And at three o'clock, we are told, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is an Aramaic call saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Sometimes you will see, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, that it's Eli, Eli. But that is because the, the writer of Matthew was worried that people wouldn't get the Aramaic. So he puts the Aramaic into Hebrew, uh, but in the Gospel according to Mark, it's kept in the original language. This takes us back, and we are sure that those who hear it and understand it are also taken back to Psalm 22, 1. No? 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 There are only three of you. Oh, okay. Um, it, which, which, uh, okay, thank you. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? So this is the opening of the 22nd Psalm, and it's where Jesus gets the cry from about, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me or abandoned me? But what's interesting about this psalm and some other psalms like 69 and, and 9 is that these psalms are talking about suffering, but the suffering of the innocent. So Jesus choosing to use that verse is a reinforcement of the idea that he is innocent and knows that he is innocent. And if you read on through all of the verses of that psalm, you get the understanding that sometimes the suffering of the innocent is within God's intention. That we don't understand it, but sometimes God expects or needs or wants that the innocent will suffer in the moment. And while Jesus is despairing, he is not failing like Peter did. And what, may, what I read, as I read this time in the Gospel according to Mark, what struck me is that Jesus still has options. And if we think in the other Gospels and in the Gospel of Mark, back through the life and the ministry of Jesus, we see someone who had the ability to work miracles, to talk with God, and I believe that, and some of the scholars believe, that Jesus at any point could have ended the crucifixion. So while he is crying out, why have you forsaken me, he's still hanging on to the purpose of all that suffering, and that's why he doesn't end it. Because it has meaning and it has purpose. And it may be way beyond what he believes that he can endure for the moment, but he is not going to be like Peter and end up denying God. He ends up calling on God, but complaining to God, which is an art form in the book of Psalms. Now, when some of the bystanders 
heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. Well, Eloi, Eloi, or Eli, Eli gets close to Elijah, I guess. And if we go back to 2 Kings, uh, the second chapter, we see that Elijah, because of his bravery and the suffering that he has gone through, gets taken up to heaven alive. He doesn't die. And the tradition is that Elijah will return at the end of the age and will rescue those who are suffering in innocence. And so they're saying, well, if Elijah shows up, that proves that Jesus is, is innocent and, and it would be a great thing to see. And either way, we win. If Elijah shows up, we're, we're at the breaking opens of the heavens. And if Elijah doesn't show up, we've got the great show of this man uh, gasping his last breaths. The bystanders uh, have misunderstood, and a scholar by the name of Donald Jewell, uh, who actually is a biblical scholar who's a friend of Ningi's. I never got to know him, but, but Ningi uh, knew him. He's a New Testament uh, scholar. Um, I rediscovered that she knew him because when I opened the front of the book, it said, to my friend Ningi, Donald Jewell. He says the reaction of the bystanders is a fitting conclusion of Jesus' ministry. Abandonment by everyone, including God. Even his last agonized call is misunderstood. And I think that's a powerful summation of what it must have felt like to have been Jesus at that point and so consistently had disciples who got it wrong. If there were two ways to look at something, they were going to take the road that's most traveled and they were going to go to the direction that wouldn't give them life or make a difference. Now the only thing is that Donald Jewell's quote leaves out the one thing that we talked about at the beginning, which is, the women, they have not run away. The women are still hidden in, in the picture there uh, somewhere. They are still there and have heard for themselves Jesus' call of anguish. The male disciples weren't there to hear it. But the women have heard that. And somebody we are told in the scripture, ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. This refers us back to Psalm 69, uh, verse 20 and 21, which reads, I looked for pity, but there was none and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Also, uh, that's the end of the quote from Psalm 69. Whoever it is that goes and grabs the, the stick and puts the sponge on it with the vinegar is fulfilling that scripture, whether they know it or not. But this person is also, in offering the sour wine, is revealing to us a part of the crucifixion process that was part of everybody's crucifixion that had a crucifixion. And because of the Romans, there were an awful lot of those people. Uh, sometimes they had 100 crosses lined up along a road uh, with people crucified. But before the person is actually crucified, that is, attached to the cross, they are offered some of this sour wine. Now, it turns out, according to the scholars, that there are really two kinds of sour wine. 
And the first kind is wine that's been mixed with myrrh. And that acts as anesthesia. So it makes the pain a little less severe when you're first being crucified. It doesn't last that long, but it gives you. The second kind of wine, the kind that Jesus is being offered here, is wine that's starting to turn to vinegar. And what this does is sort of wake you up, sort of revive you just a little bit so that you can see what's going on and talk with people. Um, but if you're being crucified, you're, I'm not sure you want to be woken up again. You might just as soon to stay half, half out of it than to be woken up. And so this is what is being offered uh, to Jesus. Now Jesus turns down the wine at the beginning, and he turns down this wine as well, which is just, you know, most people being crucified take the first wine, and they do not take the second wine. It always struck me as funny that this person goes running off, uh, gets sour wine on a sponge, and puts it on a stick and gives it to Jesus to drink. Because it seems like a friendly action. Even though what he says isn't that friendly, let's see if Elijah comes back, it seems as if there is not complete unanimity in the people that are watching that crucifixion about what is going on. And that perhaps this man is doing whatever he can to lessen the suffering of Jesus just some little bit, no matter what he has to say. Because it also is a great thirst quencher. Um, and, but as I said, it also keeps you awake, which may not be. I wonder also whether the actions of this man and running off and getting the sour wine is in contrast to all of the different taunts and insults that Jesus receives during this particular time. We know the chief priests and the other uh, priests and leaders have taunted him. We know that passers-by have taunted him. We know that other people that are being crucified with him have taunted him. So is this in some way a step down from them and therefore a contrast to the kind of words that Jesus is is, uh, has been hearing. Remember that back, well, you probably don't because I didn't, back in the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to John in verse 13, they're talking about whether John the Baptist is Elijah. And Jesus says, Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased as it is written of him. And so in the midst of this, while they're waiting for Elijah to come, Jesus is quite clear in his own mind that Elijah is not coming, that this is not the role of Elijah, because when the prophet returns, they do to the prophet what they did to the prophet the first time around. It's going on then from verse 37. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. Now this is something that, that I'm always looking for what I've missed or what now that I'm 73 years old and not remembering as much as I used to, things that I've forgotten. I've gotten to the place where I can go back and read books that I watched before, read before, and it's like I've never read them, and it's wonderful because I know some good books to read. Well, you know, as, as, you, uh, as you think about this, um, Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And I had always thought of the crucifixion as one event. Jesus gets crucified, pounded onto the cross, stuck up in the air, 
suffers and dies, and that all is the crucifixion. But in the gospel according to Mark, and in other gospels as well, the crucifixion is really when the Roman soldiers lay you down on the cross and, and attach you to that cross. That's the crucifixion. And then there's the suffering, and then there's the death. Well, what we know is often the death takes days, depending on the strength of the person. And here it is, a little strangely, that uh, Jesus gives this loud cry and he breathes his last. Because what we're told is that this giving up his last breath happens at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And he was crucified at, uh, at 6 a.m. So he's been up there now for 6 to 9, the first quarter, 9 to 12, and 12 to 3, and he dies after those nine hours, which is certainly enough suffering for anyone, but others suffered much longer. My father loved to preach on this passage, and one of the things he liked was what the 38th chapter says, and that is that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, my father taught theater, and he was the stagecraft mind, man, so I can remember as a kid sitting there in a worship service, and there's a great curtain across in the front, and when, Jesus, when my father reads this particular passage, suddenly that curtain, you can't see how, but it rips from the top to the bottom with this enormous sound. I loved that as a kid. I kept hoping he would do it every year, but he didn't do it every year. Um, maybe he was a lectionary preacher and only did it every third year. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but I, I really uh, loved that. And um, probably missed the point, in, I'm sure I missed the point entirely. We're told that this passage deliberately links us back to the tearing of the heavens when Jesus is born. So the intervention of the divine into human life is marked by a tearing of the heavens and the leaving of Jesus' life from this world is marked by the tearing of the temple in the curtain in the temple. Now, we're, we're told by scholars who admit right off that they don't really know what curtain or veil is being talked about in the temple because there's more than one. But they think that it is the curtain that was separating one of the halls from the Holy of Holies, behind which only a priest could go once a year. And when he went, there was a rope tied around his ankle so that if God overcame him while he was in there, they could pull him back out again uh, so he wouldn't die from being in the presence of God. The scholar says that the curtain has a purpose there. And the purpose of the curtain is not so people don't bother God, but it's to protect people from God. For if you see the face of God, you die. And the point, says this scholar, is that with the tearing of the curtain, suddenly no one is protected from God. I'd never thought of it that way before, that suddenly I am exposed to the presence of God, and, and I wonder how that makes 
you feel. That idea that maybe with the ripping of the temple veil, it's not just a celebration for us, because look at this, uh, Christ is uh, prevailing even in death. But with the tearing of this, we are in some way exposed to God in a way we were not. And that this is only really resolved for us in what Steve's going to talk about next week with the resurrection. Because then the protection is returned to us in the form of Jesus as the expression of who God is and the nature of God. We're also told that this signals the future fall of the temple. So the fall of the temple is a generation or two into the future, but it's really not very far away. And Judaism has been moving, struggling to find a new way to be Judaism in a world that's changing. And they, when Judaism started, they weren't dealing with Romans, they weren't dealing with this kind of occupation, though they had other occupations. And so as, as they're looking at this, the tearing of the veil in the temple assures them that Jesus' prediction that the temple is going to be destroyed, even though it wasn't happening within three days, it was destroyed within three generations. And that changed the nature of Judaism. And that the Judaism of the temple was marked by sacrifices. You'll remember that when Jesus is born, his, his parents are poor and all they can afford is the uh, economy version offering. So it's two turtle doves. Now, if they were wealthier, it would have been a, a, a lamb or it would have been an ox or something more substantial. But this system of earning favor with God through the sacrifice of blood is, in the scholar's mind, ended with the tearing of the veil in the temple at Jesus' death. Because now the, the quintessential offering of blood has been made. And Jesus having given his blood, there is no need for any other blood to be shed, even that of turtle doves. Um, I never thought of it that way before, but uh, it marks the end of the sacrificial system. Judaism is no longer a sacrificial system religion. And who's in charge of the religion has changed enormously there's no, it's no longer a high priest, though they can track who would be that uh, through genealogy, but it's the rabbis, the teachers, the people who help interpret the law are the major leaders of Judaism today. Now, verse 39. Now, when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. This confirms God's words at Jesus' baptism. This is my son, the beloved. And isn't it strange that we go from God the Father saying those words to centurion the executioner, saying this, because this isn't just any centurion who's passing by. This is a centurion who was in charge of the soldiers that had just crucified Jesus. And isn't it amazing that it's this person who has seen what has happened, but then this person has also been standing there and seen the sky go dark at noon and stay dark until Jesus death, and has no doubt seen other things that have convinced him that Jesus really must be 
somebody other than a normal person if this happens when Rome kills him. And again, it's supposed to be ironic that not only is it the executioner who repeats God's words, but that it's a Gentile who sees who Jesus is. Now, different of the disciples, and, and Mary had previously in the Gospel according to John, called Jesus the Messiah, even the son of David, the son of God. But this is to say it after the crucifixion and before the resurrection is a truly amazing thing for, um, for those who read and study the gospel. And then we run into Waldo again. Verse 40. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and of Salome. Now, the grammar here is very strange. So I'm not sure whether this means there were two Marys, Mary Magdalene and then the mother who had three kids. Or is it that there was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and then there was another mother for Joseph and another mother for Salome? So actually, there were four women. Well, it doesn't really matter how many women because there were no men. And that's the big point. And they are the only people that are left. In all of this story, they become followers of Jesus in Galilee. They fed him. They've taken care of him and the disciples. They've marched with Jesus wherever he's going. They've witnessed everything he's done. And they have followed him through the courts. And they followed them through the crucifixion. And they follow him now and to his death. We are told in the 41st verse that whether that was two women or four women who used to follow Jesus and provide for him, there were many other women, it says, who came up with Jesus to Jerusalem. You wonder how many of these women were also present, but at least the two Marys were present. We come then um, to the section about the burial of Jesus. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, um, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council who was himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now, we don't know a lot about Joseph of Arimathea because he sort of disappears back into the woodwork after he does this uh, wonderful thing. There are a lot of traditions about him becoming a significant leader and, uh, in Christianity, but I don't think we have anything from the scriptures that tell us that is in fact true. There's also not clarity about which council he was part of. Because every, every town and every district had its own council. And they had a different kind of name. And the council in Jerusalem for all of Judaism was called the Sanhedrin. But when the scripture here says that Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the council, it uses the little word for council, not the Sanhedrin word for uh, for the council. Now we're told that Jesus breathes his last at 3 p.m. And the reason for the urgency now is that the Sabbath starts in three hours. Remember, the Sabbath starts with sundown, not with midnight. It, and it varied a bit, but they're just assuming that it's a normal thing, and it's at 6 p.m., which is sort of the average. 
if Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin, then it's a mark to us that even the Sanhedrin was not unanimous about who Jesus was or how he ought to be treated. And uh, that Joseph at least was sympathetic to Jesus. Um, Pilate seems to stick with his apathetic kind of approach to things. He is the one that has to give uh, the body to Joseph of Arimathea. I think he would have given the body to anybody that came and asked for it because he really didn't care. The only thing he cared about was, is Jesus already dead? It's only been like, you know, nine hours. How, how can he be dead already? And so he calls the centurion, whom we've just heard from, and the centurion says, yes, um, he learns from the centurion that Jesus was dead, and so he gives the body to Joseph, and he's done with it. But the question is, why was Joseph asking for the body? And there are two, actually two possibilities. Christian tradition has also said, be, always said, because he's a righteous, God-fearing person, which is probably right. But other scholars are saying, when you look at that, if he's a member of the council, the last thing that the council wanted to have during the Passover was the body of a prophet on a cross. They wanted Jesus down, and they wanted him gone. And Joseph of Arimathea makes it happen. Now, so did he make it happen for the council's purpose, or did he make it happen for his own? We're told then that Joseph is really in a hurry, and so he's got to do things quickly. So he, he buys a linen cloth, because that's what you get wrapped up in, and he takes down the body, and, and there's some indication that they take down the body, so there's more than just Joseph of Arimathea, which it'd be pretty hard to take down a body from a cross by yourself. They wrap Jesus in the linen cloth and lay him in a tomb that has been hewn out of the rock. And then they roll a stone against the door of the tomb. We are told then that Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where the body was laid. So those pesky women are still at it. They can hear and learn what happens in the court of Pilate. They can follow Joseph of Arimathea as he takes the body and cares for it. And they can follow and see where the body is laid. And that marks the end of the 15th chapter. You're going to get the test if you don't start asking some questions. <laughs> or comments. You can disagree with me. Yes, Carol. Yeah, as far as the tearing of the uh, veil in the temple, is it on? Okay. Um, yeah, I was always uh, taught that the uh, significance of that uh, uh, carrying of the veil in the temple, it meant that uh, we no longer have to go through a priest to get to God. We can go directly to God. I mean, is that kind of the same thing you were saying? <laughs> yes, it is, except this is the first time that it's the table's been turned, and yeah. I've heard, well, now you're no longer protected. Okay. From the God that's on the other side okay. of that curtain. Okay. And I have another thought. I mean... Do you think part of the reason that the men hid and the women were still there, I mean, the men, I think, were afraid that they were going to be arrested and possibly crucified too, but they didn't crucify women, did they? Well, I meant to look that up, and I never found a place that told me. So yeah, I'd, I've never heard of it. I don't know. I'd never heard of it, yeah. but, but the Romans were pretty nasty yeah. people, so I wouldn't be surprised if they did. <laughs> they did, okay, and, and killed them, right. 
Josephus talks about the slaughter of all the residents of Sephorus, not sure I'm pronouncing that right, 2,000 people, men, women, and children were crucified. And okay. he reports that the smell from that drifted all the way down to Jerusalem. Yeah. Oh, wait for the mic, please. I just have a question, which might be uh, but it sounds ignorant. Uh, was this James, Jesus' brother? There are two James. I There's guess James, there the brother of Jesus, and James the lesser, okay. who is not the brother of Jesus. Okay, so, but James... The other James, not James the Lesser, was Jesus' brother. There was one, okay. yeah. Thank you. All right. Maybe behind you. You were talking about the innocence of Jesus and him suffering. Just a little more explanation. And um, does that mean we all, all innocents suffer or all of our innocents suffer? Well, what, what was being said there was that in Jesus choosing Psalm 22, and there were other Psalms like 69 and 9 that he could have chosen, he, he was directing people to a Psalm they knew was about the innocent suffering. So by his choosing that Psalm, he's making a declaration that he sees himself as the innocent. Because it's the innocent that say Eloi Eloi Laban Sabachthani. So that's that's at least what the scholar is saying. I read somewhere that uh, not only was uh, Joseph of Arimathea a member of the Sanhedrin, but that one of his good friends was Nicodemus. Is it possible that Nicodemus was the helper in, at the cross? Could have been. I'm getting much more cautious, though, about not accepting something as the way it really is unless I can find what it, where it says it in the Bible. And I found an awful lot of things that people assume. Like, people assume that the reason the centurion says, surely this is the son of God, was because he saw the temple veil being ripped in half. Well, that would only work if Jesus is crucified in the temple because he isn't close enough to see it. But four or five commentators say, say that, say that he says that about Jesus because he saw the temple veil ripped. Well, it, to me, it does, doesn't add up, so I'm not buying it. And if I ever get to write a PhD thesis, I'll show them that they're all very wrong about that. The other two uh, thieves that were the two thieves that were crucified on either side of Jesus, did they? It doesn't mention that they got taken down. I always thought that they had to take everybody that was crucified off the cross before the Sabbath. But maybe that wasn't true? I, I don't believe that was the truth and I, okay. because it's a Roman thing and, and Romans didn't care all that much unless the person were a religious figure okay. themselves so that there was some crisis okay. about having him on so the cross. So they wanted Jesus down particularly because he was a religious figure. Okay, I never realized that before. Okay. Well, one of the things that they also noticed here, and perhaps you did as we read through it, that it talks about the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, uh, and the commentators say that this is a deliberate use of the Roman military system of counting. That normal Jewish people, temple people, would not have said at the third hour, at the ninth hour, you know, at the sixth hour, that that was a Roman military way of counting time. And because that was being used, it was ironically making very clear who was in charge. 
The Romans were so much in charge, they could kill whoever they want in whatever way they want, and they could say when the time was that it was done. So Jesus was operating and crucified in a world that was completely owned and controlled by the Roman army. I don't know if that makes sense for you, but it does uh, for me. One of the questions that I found myself asking uh, when I got to the end of this, and I need to say that I'm not sure I thank Steve for this opportunity because it's sort of like, you know, preaching from the bottom of the well. You know, uh, Jeremiah was thrown down the well and went on prophesying from down at the bottom. You know, to get thrown back after Easter, back into Good Friday, you know, th this is a pretty heavy kind of uh, passage to deal with. Um, but it, one of the questions that I began to ask in my own head was, why was the burial so important? I just assume it's a burial. That's what you do with a dead body. You bury them. But the kind of detail and attention that's given to it, when a lot of attention and detail is not given to an awful lot of other things that surely were important, made me wonder about why it was so important that Jesus was buried. And we know it's important because you have the whole story of Joseph of Arimathea going and getting permission to do that, and we have it wrapping up, the body being wrapped and put in the tomb, and the tomb sealed, and the two women seeing that everything that goes on. So we know it's important. Steve? Isn't it true still today that when a Jewish person passes that they have to be interred at a certain hour before the sun sets? Yes, I believe that's right, that you so have to be. perhaps it was the same back then, yeah. making it, you know, the, the importance of getting the body buried before the sun goes down. Right. I always felt also that, you know, with the crucifixion, there was an awful lot of, you know, like two or three years prior that, you know, there was all these miracles going on. And, and you know, if the Sanhedrin or the you know Pharisees or the Sadducees wanted to bring a case against him that they would have like had people out there trying to either refute or dispute all these claims that Jesus you know and how he rose to the level of the concern to the temple system that he was about to tear apart that this had to be then thrown to the Romans for his execution. It just, it, it, it all is what we grow up with and we understand, but if I, if, it, if I was a historian going back in that particular time, I would be scratching my head saying, this is, a lot of it seems illogical, you know? Couldn't they just send out an assassin and kill yeah. him them themselves? As we notice about any empire, if you have the weapons and you have the strongest army, you don't have to be very smart and you don't have to care what other people think. You get to define reality. One more. And maybe this comes from <laughs> movies and books, but did they, when they crucified somebody, did they typically take them down as soon as they die or did they leave them there for, as an example and did the Romans really care if he came down? Yeah, I, I've said. read that they had whatever custom they wanted to have, but that often the bodies were left there till they rotted off the, off the cross. Because the whole point, this is the crucifixion. A crucifixion is a method of terrorism, state-sponsored terrorism, and you want people as scared as they can possibly be and the disintegrating body is pretty scary. So, okay, I think we're, my wife tells me we're at the end of it. Uh, so let's have a word of prayer and close. We thank you, God, for your love, which was made known to us through all that Christ suffered in the crucifixion. And we give you thanks that the story did not end, that, that women were faithful and followed, and that the resurrection occurred. 
and that we live as children of a risen Lord. We ask your blessing upon us as we go forth from here. In Jesus' name, amen.